In many areas of the hospital, even on the cancer service, for example, or in the cardiovascular service, there are new therapies that have really changed how we view disease and how we can live with disease. But in neurology, and again, especially acute brain injury, there are very few effective therapies. That is, if you were to round on the neurology service, you'd see patients who are often physically devastated, emotionally devastated with really life-threatening diseases or progressive diseases for which there are no effective therapies. That's particularly true in acute brain injury. I think it would surprise many people to know that after an acute brain injury or after um, a large stroke, for example, there are no neuroprotective drugs currently available to improve functional outcomes. CN105 really represents translational drug development, and in many ways it's a backwards drug development. So traditionally, from a very basic science laboratory, one might look at a very specific cellular mechanism to see if you can influence that and influence disease. Unfortunately, that often doesn't translate into clinical efficacy for a variety of reasons. There's a lot of redundant mechanisms in biology, so even if you tweak one specific pathway, you may not actually affect a better outcome. CN105 represented a different strategy. Here what we did is look at an endogenous brain protein. This is a brain protein that we all have, and it turns out that one form of this protein, one genetic polymorphism, is associated with better functional outcome. So what we did was really try to understand this protein, which is called apolipoprotein E, understand how it modified brain injury, and make it druggable. We're so excited to see many projects have translated it from our preclinical work to clinical trials. A number of uh, unique compounds are in phase one trials. Several of them have moved to phase two clinical trials. One of the most exciting aspects of this is that many of these represent the first in-class therapies to these uh, neurological disorders, such as subarachnoid hemorrhage, trauma, and uh, intracranial hemorrhage, for which no effective therapies currently exist. So what is it about differences in our genetic makeup that determine the extent of an injury, a brain injury, or how we recover a brain injury? Why is it that a patient who presents in the intensive care unit with one type of injury that looks very similar to the patient in the room next to them, yet patient one has a very bad outcome, and patient two, although the injury looks similar, um, has a good prognosis. Uh, we believe that that is due in part to differences in their genetic makeup. One of the big issues with a brain injury is, um, is inflammation. So a lot of these genes are actually related to, to inflammation. So if we can identify um, a target that could help decrease the inflammation following these brain injuries, and that includes both systemic inflammation throughout the body as well as neuroinflammation. We feel that that could really benefit treatment and prognosis and clinical outcome for these patients with, uh, with brain injuries. So my lab is specifically interested in <clears throat> brain monitoring and how the brain uh, is affected by injury and what physiologic impact that has. When you have a heart attack, uh, we bring you into the heart ICU and we hook you up to the heart monitor and monitor your heart and blood pressure very carefully. If you have a brain injury like a stroke or your, uh, trauma to your brain, uh, we hook you up to the heart monitor and we monitor your heart and blood pressure very uh, carefully. So this is because this is what we do, we, what we can measure, but it's not necessarily appropriate for brain injury. And so my lab focuses on finding uh, technologies and ways of directly monitoring the brain uh, during the injury state. So we might be able to better track recovery, measure impact of therapeutic intervention, um, and maybe even be able to predict outcome. <laughs>